you and I are children of post-enlightenment. Remember yesterday I mentioned that some people have this idea that when you come to the heavenly gate, there will be enter your username and your password. The, the idea is if you give the right answer, you make it. So if in today's world you believe that the world is flat like a pancake, you are a fool forgotten here by unenlightened eras. But if you say that it's like a football flying in the middle of nowhere, you gave the right answer. So enlightenment influenced us that we look for the right answer. And it influences also the way we read the Bible. We try to treat it as a book that is supposed to provide the right answers. And so if you provide the right answers, you pass the heavenly scrutiny. Also, Hitler's minister of propaganda, Goebbels, taught us that 1,000 times repeated lie becomes the truth. And if you just repeat something in Christianity ad infinitum, you start believing it. And so it's easy to miss what the Bible is all about. And that's what we are talking about. Is it about a proof text? Is it about dogmas? what we are supposed to believe, what is it all about? And the important aspect is that it came to us as a story. When you look at the Bible, it starts with a creation story. And in the world where the kings rule the nations, why? Because you need to listen to us. Every king claims that he is there because of the will of God. He is the Son of God. The creation story says that actually God created us as a tselem, as an image of God. Who? Not only the king, but everybody. Even women. Even children. I will never forget when I uh, taught in Russia at the seminary, I did some evangelistic meetings, and uh, during one of those meetings, uh, my son, who was about uh, five years old, was sitting in one of the chairs at the end of the row, and a lady came from outside, pushed him aside, and said, I'm going to sit here. And I thought, wow, children don't count. You know, this is my seat. I mean, I'm going to sit here doesn't matter. Here is a creation story which says everybody is an image of God. And that's why I have this astounding dignity and value. Everybody. Then you have the story of Abraham who leaves the father's household and everything familiar and sets out on a journey to a new land. Imagine, can you understand how radical that is? In the world then, people didn't do anything like that. Why? Because they had this cyclical understanding of the time, of reality. Everything that happens now, what happened, happens now will happen again. What happened to our forefathers is going to happen to us and is going to happen to our children. But Abraham steps out of this cycle. He walks into a new future. One that has not happened before. You don't have to repeat everything that happened before. Life is not an endless cycle. Life is a story. A story that has a beginning and the end. And that means... There is a future. By the way, future worth looking forward to. Once again, for us living in 2017 in England, it's almost impossible to imagine the level of fear that people in times of Moses lived. 
few years ago when we had this uh, eclipse of the sun, I was visiting one of our schools, actually the most northern school in Adventist school in the world is in Norway, in Tromsø. And that was the day when the eclipse of the sun came and the school bought these special goggles, you know, special things to put on their eyes. And the children were watching the eclipse of the sun. And with the pastor, we uh, also watched with them and laughed. If there are not enough of these uh, special goggles that, <clears throat> you know, they will see another one, but we should be the ones that are going to see it because we are not going to see another one. And you could, you could realize when the eclipse came, how it became darker. You could feel it became colder. And the children were noisy and looking and laughing and enjoying. I said to him, imagine if this happened just two, three hundred years ago, everybody would be on their knees, scared to death. You see the northern lights there and you understand it's so spooky why people believe that you should not let your children run on the street because it can damage them. This is demonic. It's just electromagnetic waves. But imagine the fear in which people lived and into this comes this idea that actually life is not an endless cycle. It's a story story with the beginning and the end, and the future is something worth looking forward to. And the story of Abraham is part of the bigger story. And we said it starts with the story of creation in the Garden of Eden. The key text is Genesis 3.9, which says, Adam, where are you? And the key theological truth was sin does not change God's relationship with me, but my relationship with God. What are the consequences of sin? What is the result? The first time sin is used or named by the word sin. In Genesis 3, the first sin is mentioned, but the word sin does not occur. It's the genius of the Bible writer that talks about the sin without even mentioning it and gives you the most profound understanding of what sin is all about. But the first time sin is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 4, when God speaks to Cain, because Cain is upset that life did not turn out the way he wanted it to be, because somehow his sacrifice was not accepted as he imagined it would be. And God speaks to him and says, I am not against you. The sin lies at the door. And what is the sin? When the sin is mentioned for the first time in the Bible by name, it's violence. Just because you don't like how the things worked out, you cannot be violent toward your brother. Imagine in what's going on in England and Bruxelles, Brussels yesterday and uh, this world last few months and years. Here is the book which says, just because you don't like something happening in your life, in your sphere of influence, that doesn't mean that you can be violent towards somebody else. You can have dominion over this. You can overcome this. Just because you are frustrated with the current state, don't turn violent. And by chapter 6, the whole earth is full of violence. And by chapter 9 and chapter 11, we have a global problem. There is the empire that is being built by bricks, oppressing other people. And the question is, how much worse can it get? And there comes the next continuation of the story, is the story of Exodus. The location is Egypt, the key text was Exodus 3.7, and the key phrase is, I have heard the cry. Because by Exodus, the first chapter of the second book of the Bible, we have the whole nation in slavery. And if you are a slave, 
Now, this is not just that you have bad conditions. Guys, this is not going to change. Tomorrow, next month, next year. And the question you ask, are we going to be slaves all the time? Are we going to be slaves forever? Will Pharaoh we always have the power over us? And what's worse, is God on our side? Where is God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? How can we think that our God is powerful? Remember what Pharaoh says to Moses when Moses comes and says, let my people go? Pharaoh says, and who is your God? I don't know your God. Because the reason why you are our slaves is because your God is a weak God. Our God is powerful. Of course I am not letting you go. Because our gods are strong and your God is weak. And you have listened to Juan Carlos Patrick this morning and showed you how the plagues of Egypt were all gear geared towards showing actually your gods are powerless. God of heaven is the one who is powerful. And so people ask the question, are our lives set in stone? Is the ultimate reality antagonistic or friendly? Because if you live in Egypt, you know how hot it can get during the day, how cold it can get during the night. And of course, they did not travel to the polar regions of the planet, and they did not fly to the space to know that it's easy to come to the conclusion that your life is under threat because of the cosmic radiation, because it seems that the ultimate reality is not friendly towards us. And so, God hears the cry, comes the story, and He provides the redemption, rescue and redemption from sin and oppression. And He starts the good news from any oppression. That means if you have ever been bullied, if you ever held a boot on the neck of someone else, if you try to dominate or oppress someone, if you used power to dehumanize others, if you used religion to oppress other peoples, your days are numbered because God sides with oppressed. God sides with the underdog, with the powerless. Tell me, is this good news? That's the de-salvation act of the Old Testament. You can change the world by entering into freedom. You can pass on to your children something liberating. They don't have to live in what you are living. There is a businessman, you know that Palestine was at the junction of business routes. And there's a businessman coming, and he's tired after a long journey, and an Israelite comes out of his tent, greets him and says, Sir, can I take care of your horse? Can I feed your horse? Oh, yeah, that's very kind of you, sure. Can I offer you something to eat, something to drink? You are very kind, you are very nice. Let me pay for that. Oh, no, no, you don't need to pay. Why are you doing this? Let me tell you a story. Remember? Nicholas Thomas Wright says, when people wake up in the morning, they want someone at the head of their bed telling them, do this, don't do that. Instead, the Bible says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. We have been slaves in Egypt. We have been mistreated. We have been harshly dealt with. But God was kind to us. And He told us, you be kind to people who pass by, to the aliens. And that's why we live here. That's why we treat you this way. A few weeks later, the businessman returns from his trip back from Egypt to Babylonia, somewhere in Iraq. And he passes by the tent Friday afternoon, 
just about the sun is going to set. And the man comes out, out of his tent and says, Sir, would you like to have a break? You know, they did not have this motorway rest areas, so take a break. He would feed his horse. He would feed the man. And then they would start the Sabbath. What does it mean to start the Sabbath? Never heard about starting the Sabbath. Let me tell you a story. We have been slaves in the Egypt. We have been harshly dealt with, mistreated, but God told us, remember the Sabbath day because you have been slaves. Wow, never heard that before. You see, you start with a Bible story and in no time you are dealing with violence, with hope, with despair, with slavery, with oppression, with empires, with human consciousness. You start with what happened then and there. And before you realize it, bypassing your barriers against conviction. Now, if you tell people, and this is what the Bible says, you are supposed to believe it. People start fighting you. Why should I believe in an old book? And by the way, why should anyone tell me what I am supposed to believe? I am going to believe what I want to believe. Because all of us have barriers against conviction. But just by reading the ancient story, understanding what happened then and there, you are suddenly here and now. You deal with questions about your own life, about the fears and despair that each one of us experience from time to time. Are our lives set in stone? Can we change? And you go from the past to the present and to the future of all life. Why? Because the old book is not boring. If it's boring, you are reading another book. Because it's not only a book about them there. It's about how God speaks to you here and now. So that he can change the way you think, the way you feel that you can become a different person today. Now, we have said that we are all born in Egypt, in slavery. And the problem is not only our personal sin in a vertical relationship with God, but also the embedded sin in a system, in a society in which we live, the systemic injustice the system that holds people down. But God provides rescue and redemption from any sin and any oppression. All right, and so the story continues. And what happened, it continues from the Garden of Eden into Egypt. The key thing is I have heard the cry, and God provides rescue and redemption from any sin and any oppression. All right, what happens next? The story continues to Sinai. So what happens when people have been rescued? When people have been freed from slavery, does God want them to create a club so that they can talk about it endlessly? They will have a liberation club, an exodus club, not slaves anymore club. Now, if you don't understand the story, you can easily read the Sinai and Exodus 20 as something what you are supposed to do. But remember, God did not send Moses with two tables of stone and said, here are the Ten Commandments. I will give you six months to see how you are doing. And if you get to, what, at the British University, 39% is a failure, so 40% is a passing grade. So if you get 40% or 60%, what, 80%, 90%, I will come and liberate you. If not, we will extend the extend, we will give you a grace period for six more months. No. He took them out of Egypt. 
regardless of their performance. If you don't understand it, you are going to read the Ten Commandments, you are going to read what happened at Sinai as something to do. But if you see the story, if you understand the biblical storyline, you will see it as something they are supposed to be. God wants them to be somebody. He rescued them. He brought them out of slavery so that, why? Let's listen to what it says in Exodus 19. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. If I were at Newbold, I would say, underline eagle's wings. Eagle's wings will become a metaphor for rescue, for salvation. This is what God did in Egypt. And every time eagle's wings appears in the Bible, it's allusion to the salvation act, what God does for us. <clears throat> and notice this now. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, if you obey me fully... And I would say, circle if. Here is the God, the king of the universe, and he says, if. Remember, Pharaoh said, no, if. You are going to do this. You are going to produce your quota, even where I don't care where you come find the straw. You just produce your quota of bricks. God says, if. Why? Because with this God, you have freedom. You are free. You can choose to obey, and you can choose to disobey. You can tell him, I love you, and you can tell him, I don't care about you. This is not uh, spiritual or emotional blackmail. Now, because I brought you out of Egypt, this is what you need to do. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, don't you understand this, that I love you more than anyone else? The whole earth belongs to me. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Why did he bring them out? So that they could be somebody. Who? Kings and priests. Kingdom of priests or priesthood of kings. You can translate the Hebrew both ways. Kings and priests. Now imagine, 400 plus years, people have been in slavery. People have been beating them, shouting at them. They treated them like, if you have a cup, if you break the cup at home, okay, no big deal, you buy another one. Who cares? If you kill a slave, you buy another one. Who cares? They don't have the concept of human rights in those days. And God says to them, you are a princess. You are a prince. You are a daughter of a heavenly king. You are a son of the king of the universe. You see yourselves not as slaves, bunch of slaves. You see yourselves as kings. There was a seminar there about self-worth. Now, this is what God does for them. He gives them a seminar about self-worth. How I see you how you need to see yourselves. Remember, we already know from the Genesis 3, the problem is not how God sees us. The problem is how we see Him and how we see ourselves. If only you could see yourselves as I see you, as daughters and sons of the King of Heaven. And priests. Who is a priest? Priests are the ones who mediate the knowledge of divine to other people. If you want to understand the religion, look at the priests. If you want to understand who God is, look at the life of the priest. When people see you, they will see who God is, what God is like. This is who I want you to be. Now, why is God doing this? Because, write this down, God is looking for a body. 
A God of universe is looking for a body to represent Him. Now remember, in the creation story, you learn that people are dependent. God took the dust of the earth, formed it, and then breathed the breath, and the human and man became the living soul. But you are dependent. You don't have life in yourself. And God created the trees, beautiful to look at, and for food, because you don't have life in yourself. You need something else, someone else to sustain you. And every Sabbath, every week, you are reminded you are not a God. So when the sun sets on Friday night, the first full day of Adam's life, remember, Sabbath is the seventh day for God, not for Adam. For Adam is the first day. God says, put your work aside. It doesn't matter what you do. It matters that we meet together. You have been created for me. So every week he's reminded of the fact that he's a dependent creature. That he needs to depend on the, someone to survive. God brings the trees to feed them, to survive, to give them food, to sustain. But then starts the unraveling of creation. The fall in chapter 3. Did God really say... And notice... The serpent is attacking the relationship of trust between Eve and God. Eve, you think that God is your friend, but is he really on your side? Or is he preventing you from entering into a higher level of experience? Is he withholding something away from you? And you know the rest. And in chapter 3, 23... You read that they, Adam and Eve, are banished from the garden. And why are they banished from the garden? Because sin caused this magical thinking in their mind. They took the fruit and ate the fruit. And God says, Adam, what happened? How come that yesterday you were looking forward to our meeting and today you are hiding? What has changed? Not me, I am coming as I did yesterday. Nothing has changed on my part, but something has changed in you. What is it? What have you done? What happened? And man and his wife, the Bible says, took the leaves and made a covering for themselves. They thought, okay, if the fruit of the tree produced this, let's take the leaves and resolve the problem. Actually, the story continues, and they have this magical thinking, okay, if we could just eat the tree, if we could eat the fruit from the other tree, that would solve the problem. And so God banished them from the garden, Genesis 3.23. And not only that, he put cherubims with AK-47, with Kalashnikov there. Why? He needs to escort them to the gates of paradise and say, you guys have no idea what happened today. You have no grasp of the far-reaching consequences, of the cosmic consequences of what happened today. Or the world, life is never going to be the same. Have you read in the Patriarchs and Prophets that even the atmosphere changed? Even the digestion of the lion has changed. And so God escorts them to the gates of paradise and they feel God is against us. Why are you doing this to me? Was it that serious? Now, God speaks to when the violence gets out of hand and those who want to worship God can't because those who don't worship God are violent toward them and prevent them from worshiping God. God speaks to Noah. Then in Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham. We have covered that, how he steps out of the cyclical understanding of the world. God speaks to Jacob. Yesterday night you heard about the letter and how God speaks to him. God speaks to Joseph. 
And then we come to, ex to Exodus 6.28. And now God speaks to Moses. What happens in Sinai is connected with the preceding story. God speaking to Noah, God speaking to Abraham, God speaking to Isaac, God speaking to Jacob, God speaking to Joseph, and now God speaks to Moses. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? I have this stutter. He's not going to listen to me. Besides, who am I? By the way, who was Moses? He was the graduate of the top military academy of Egypt. Who was he? He was the future Pharaoh of Egypt. But now, after 40 years, he sees himself as a shepherd. He's not going to listen to me. I am nobody. Why would he listen to me? I'm just a shepherd. And you know how the Egyptians look at shepherds. Remember when Joseph, the prime minister, introduced his family to Pharaoh of the day? He says, I will give you the best part of the land. And Joseph says, mm -mm, this will not work out. We know how the... Egyptians look at shepherds, and my family, they are all shepherds. He's not going to listen to me. Now listen to this. Exodus 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you God to Pharaoh. Now I am using the NIV, the nearly inspired version, to put there. And, of course, it gives you a good evangelical bias, so it puts the word, I made you like God to Pharaoh. Uh, like is not in Hebrew. Just check your King James Version. It's not there. Uh, and uh, sadly enough, it's not a trap to make the things easier to understand, but if you add something, you should either put, put it into italics or you should put it into brackets. You should indicate to the reader, I am adding something to make it easier for you to understand. But if you look at NIV, you see, I made you like go to Pharaoh, so I added the italics and the brackets in the text. They are not in your NIV. Why? Because this idea is heretical. And good evangelicals don't believe that somebody can be God besides God. But God says to Moses, look, I made you God to Pharaoh. He will listen to you. And Aaron will be your PR man. He will be your communication director. Moses will go to Pharaoh to tell him God's message. Notice, not that you will tell him about God, not that you will give him a brochure, you give him a pamphlet, you give him a good book to read. No, no. Let me tell you what you are supposed to communicate to him. No, you will be the message. Now, God could appear himself to Pharaoh in any way he wanted. Remember, a few centuries later, he will appear to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. God will speak to people any way he wants. Out of 1,000 ways how God wants to re can reveal himself to anybody, he chooses to show up to Pharaoh who he is through a human being. Notice, he doesn't say, you will be somebody who will carry the message to Pharaoh. So make sure you learn it well, learn it by heart, don't mess it up. The success of this mission depends on your 
faithfully relaying it to Pharaoh. No, no. You will be God to Pharaoh. He is going to listen to you. Why? Because God is looking for a body. So, in Genesis 7, 1, we read, God says to Moses, I have made you God to Pharaoh. He is going to listen to you. Now, the symbol of Egypt is a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid sits the king who is called Pharaoh in Egypt. And everybody below has to listen to what the Pharaoh says. And those below need to listen to their bosses. And then you have the slaves at the very bottom. Now, at the heart of every religion is somebody who says, you guys need to listen to me because God speaks to me. And because God does not want to have replicated the same thing replicated again and again, you know what happens six weeks later? Six weeks later, 40 days later, God speaks to the whole nation. In chapter 19, verse 10, be ready for the third day. Israel, prepare to meet your God. Moses communicates the message to people. God wants to speak to you. Why? Because he does not want another pyramid. He doesn't want another Pharaoh, Moses, turning into another Pharaoh. God speaks to me, and you guys listen to what I say. Because what I say to you is, comes from, directly from God. And so for the first time in history, remember, being banished from the garden, is God against us? This is undoing the consequences of sin. Because God is not against us. He is going to liberate us, to bring us out of slavery, and now he's going to talk to everybody. And what is he going to talk to everybody? What is he going to say? Remember the story. Remember the experience. I did something for you. Never forget that. Never forget how it felt when you have been crying out and I heard your cry. Remember how it felt? Make sure you don't turn into oppressors who are causing other people to cry. So, here's the first lesson from the story of Exodus, from the story of Sinai, sorry. God always invites people to meet with Him. Israel I'm glad somebody's there. <laughs> Israel, prepare to meet your God. God speaks to the whole group of people, to everybody. Two million people hear God speaking to them. Forty days ago, there have been nobodies. Only the slave masters shouted at them. Now God of universe speaks to them and says, you are my treasured possession. What does it mean? I see you as princesses and princes. I see you as my children. I want you to be priests. I want you to be the message, the representatives of who I am. Meet your God. The response to banishment from Eden is Sinai. God speaks to everybody. Not only Exodus shows us that he's on our side, he hears the cry of the oppressed, he's on the side of the powerless and the underdog. Sinai shows that he speaks to everybody. Second lesson. You are the message. Your experience of rescue 
is your message. Now, God doesn't say, okay, and now when you have experienced something, make sure you are creative enough to articulate what the message is all about. And say, oh, I can't do it, I'm not that creative. Make sure you don't mess it up. Salvation of people depends on how you pass on the message. No. Oh, let me tell you, you are supposed to tell them these five things. Let me give you a short list, or let me give you a longer list. These are the 28 fundamental beliefs that you are supposed to tell them. No, you are the message. Go and be the kings and priests. God, first and foremost, doesn't tell them what to do, but who, are who they are supposed to be. They are supposed to be a new type of community. Because God is looking for the body, people who will be His message. Luke starts, Acts 1.1. In the first book, Theophilus, I told you what, God, what Jesus began to do and to teach. And this second book is a continuation of the same story, how God, what God does and continues to teach to the community. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, You are one body, but the body has different members. And verse 27, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, You are the body of Christ. Where does the idea come from? It goes all the way to Exodus. You are the message. God continues liberation from sin. Personal sin, systemic sin, and any kind of oppression. How? Through the new community that He created. Through you. So when people rent a van and drive into a group of people on a bridge, in a mosque, when people take a bomb and explode, try to explode it at the train station, when a fire starts and people are running for life, what's the question that you and I ask? What's the question that you are asked as a believer, as a Christian? Tell me, where is God in all this? You know why the story of Sinai is important? In the story of Sinai, God turns the table around. God turns the question around. Where are you? You are the message. Where is God? God is in those who put their arms around those who lost everything. God is in those who feed the hungry, who bring, who serve, who comfort, who do something for those in difficult situation. On Sinai or at Sinai, God is inviting people to be the message. God saying to people, where are you? I am here. I did something for you. What are you now doing with the suffering of the world? You are God's answer to what is going on. Trying to make life. Trying to do something for those refugees. Ask someone from Newbold to tell you what they do for the refugees in Dunkirk. Ask Bobby Ball to tell you about what he does for people there in Kennington community. How are you trying to help those who are in a different country, don't know the language? 
How do you mentor those kids who have no father, whose parents are in prison? God says, I am looking for people who will be the message. Notice, he doesn't say, I am looking for people who can protest all the bad things that are going on in the world. I am looking for people who will boycott bad things, who will make it known what they stand against. Because that's the best way to be defined by what you are against, isn't it? I am looking for people who are angry about how bad is this world and how worse and worse it's becoming. Is God looking for people who are angry? Look at our world. Angry people are dangerous. God is looking for people who will be the message. Not those who say, we have the message here, we carry it here. If we just say it right, let me learn it by heart. Why? Because what you can do in your sphere of influence is something else than what she can do. What I can do as a pastor is very different, or theology professor, is very different, different what you can do as a housewife, as a mom at home. People have this idea, you know, I have a friend who runs a big company, and from time to time he gets this idea, oh, I should sell my business company and I should become a pastor. And I feel, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> a, you have no theological training. B, you are meeting people I would never meet as a pastor because of your business. You can be a witness, you can be the message there in your sphere of influence. You could never be if you become a colporter or a pastor. Reformation took care of this. John Calvin taught us. Before John Calvin, if you want to serve the Lord and you are a male, you become either a monk or a priest. And if you are a female, you become either a nun or a nurse. But John Calvin came and said, no, any vocation that you do for God is holy. So if you are an IT person in your job, if you are a nurse, if you are a teacher, if you are, you name it. You are the message there. Through you, God is doing something, reaching out to people. You and I could never reach in our sphere of influence. So the medium is the message. Not do you need to learn this by heart and make sure you don't mess it up. You are the message. But then you say, oh, I can't be the message because I am screwed up. I am not perfect yet. So here is the third point from the story of Sinai. How perfect were the bunch of slaves who have been in slavery 400 plus years? Tell me, how perfect? Not at all. So when you feel, I can't embody the message because I have all these flaws, God says, that's not the problem. If you want it in vernacular, write this down. Your crap is the beauty of the message. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. You are somehow asleep this morning. You are looking old for lunch, okay? All right. Your crap is the beauty of the message. You know why? Because the message is not about you anyway. The message is about God. If you wait until you are perfect, you are never going to be the message. Besides, you know what happens? People will look at you and say, this is not for me. I, can, I could never belong there. I would spoil it for them. I am not that perfect. So as we say in accreditation when we come to a school, the problem is not the problem. The problem is if you don't know you have a problem, then it's a problem because you are doing nothing to resolve the problem. So as long as you live in repentance, your failings make the message authentic. You know what is Christian's job regarding sin? To confess it. 
There are some Christians who believe that the job of a Christian is to tell the world what is their sin, what they are doing wrong. These people don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Last time I checked, that was the job description of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, He can do a better job than you and me. He can tell people, getting into their subconsciousness when they can't sleep at night, and tell them gently in such a way that you and I would never do that. We would damage them, hurt them, harm them. He can do a better job than you and I. Our job vis-a-vis -vis sin is to confess. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convict. And as long as you keep confessing, as long as you say, mea culpa, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner too. Your message is authentic. Because if not, you know what will be the result? You start pretending. You start pretending you are perfect. And nothing kills community so effectively as pretension. Nothing kills community as pretending. You know why 70% of young people say, sorry, I am out of this? They know they are not perfect. And they feel, what's the point of pretending? So, you are the message. When I say little boy, what's that? What comes to your mind? Is it a description? Not a big boy, the little boy. Is it a term of affection? There is my little boy, actually, too. That was in 1994. Is it a term of derision? Ah, he's just a little boy. What is little boy? Let me tell you what is little boy. This is little boy. That's the bomb that fell on Hiroshima and killed 80,000 people using only 2% of the destructive substance. The other was dispersed in the air. 2% of that bomb killed 80,000 people. Now, you can write on the outside whatever you want. You could write, have a nice day, don't worry, be happy. It's still an atomic bomb. You are not going to have a nice day if it's a bomb. You can call it whatever you want. But the mission, the purpose, and the identity of the bomb is very clear. It's not decisive what's written on the side. So you are the message. God is where you are. God is mentoring those kids in your community. God is taking interest in those that others are not interested. You are the message. God counts on you to pass on the message of rescue and redemption. And your experience is what God is going to use to reach the world and to finish the work. So, the location is Sinai. The key text is Exodus 7, 1 and 19, 6. The key phrase is kingdom of priests or priests of priestly kings and a different nation. Please don't understand the holy in the Catholic sense better than the other. It just means different. For different use. You will be a different type of community. And the key theological truth is you will be God to Pharaoh. You are the message. God gives them the mission, the identity, and the purpose. You will be a different type of community. Now, is that the end of the story? No. I wanted to say same time, but not same time. Same place, but one hour earlier tomorrow we will continue to see how the if was fulfilled, how the story continues into Jerusalem. 
All right, stand up and we will pray, and I will let you go for your lunch. Our gracious Lord, we want to thank you for what you have done in the life of each one of us, how you have rescued us and brought freedom from the past, from the sins, how you have found us in the world where we have been lost, for your amazing grace that touched each one of us. We thank you also for what you did for us as a body of believers, both in 19th century surviving the great disappointment and in the past decades and years as well. And now we pray as we can make difference in our sphere of influence, in our work, with people that we play, that we suffer, that we celebrate. Give us wisdom to be that type of people you want us to be. Help us to be what matters the most, present in the lives, joys, and suffering of people around us reflecting, representing you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed afternoon.